That can't be it. Trust me. I know what I'm doing. This is just a flashing reload loop, right? Yeah. Inside SGX, see? The machine froze again. This is completely reproducible. What if you reduce the number of rounds here? Doesn't crash. Mm, okay, but if you stop this and increase it again. Frozen. I don't have time for that. Maybe you can try this on some other machine or something. But I didn't get it to work on another machine. But this is really interesting. So what do you think is going on here? Um, Let's think about it systematically. Does it freeze when running when when you run the code outside of SGX? No. So it must be something within SGX or something. It has something to do with SGX. Yeah. The flash and reload loop uh, that you have here. Fewer iterations, you have no crash. More iterations, you have a crash. Mm -hmm. What if you remove the flash and reload? No crash. Flash and reload reaches the DRAM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, how did you pick that address? That's just one of my variables. Can you try different ones here? Mm, yeah, different sure. Addresses. I will try that. So I tried with tons of different addresses. Global addresses, local addresses, addresses that are not even in SGX. Mm -hmm. And for most of them, it doesn't crash. For not a single address outside of SGX, it does crash. Okay, but that supports the theory that this is related to SGX. Mm -hmm. hmm. Another thing I tried, I didn't flash and reload a single address, but eight random addresses. Yeah. And this appears to work even better than flash and reloading only a single address. So what does... I'm still wondering about SGX here. What does SGX memory have that normal memory does not have. Hmm. It's encrypted and it has integrity protection, right? You're right, yeah. The memory range is encrypted and integrity protected. Mm -hmm. huh. If the encryption fails... Th that would probably lead to, to crashes, but some with some more randomness, I guess. Okay, so what happens if the integrity fails? I'm not sure. What would be reasonable to do? I mean, you cannot recover from that. So maybe they freeze the CPU. They just freeze the CPU because it's an error that they cannot correct. And also it's a sign that the hardware cannot be trusted anymore. That's right. So how can we know if it is an integrity error? We could fill all the memory on the system with data that we know. And then we run this hammering loop that you have there with the random accesses and then check whether any of the memory locations has an integrity error. Mm -hmm. I will try that, but maybe not in Claudio's system. <laughs> I will try it on my machine. Yeah. Maybe it's just an issue of broken RAM on Claudio's system. That's possible. <laughs> Okay, here it runs. Okay. Whoa. There are, there are several memory corruptions there. And it looks like it's only single bits that change. Wow. And this is now on your laptop, right? Yes. Wow, I think we need to think about this a bit more. Yeah. Maybe you should have a look how the theorem really works. Yes. Here's a DRAM. 
Oh, I remember that. We found a sidechain in there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the DRAM is organized in uh, banks grouped into bank groups ranks and channels. And on DDR4, for instance, you would have something like 64 banks split over all these channels, ranks, bank groups. Hmm. For parallelism, right? For parallelism. And uh, yeah, within each bank, you then had these uh, so-called rows. And the row buffer, the end. And the row buffer, yes. And when accessing a row, it is buffered in there, in the row buffer. I remember that. Mm -hmm. So now the rows themselves, they consist of cells and each cell consists of a transistor and a capacitor. The capacitor stores a tiny amount of charge to store a value in a cell. Or it doesn't store charge for the opposite value. Yeah, uh, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, now capacitors lose charge over time. Ah. And so my DRAM doesn't hold the data forever. Exactly. And the DRAM, for that reason, has a refresh interval. The DDR standard says each row must be refreshed within 64 milliseconds. And the DRAM should then guarantee that the data values are not lost if it is refreshed correctly. So you say the refresh is maybe not there early enough? Could be, right? Hmm. But I don't think that explains what I'm seeing. If the refreshes would be too slow, wouldn't I see the flips everywhere without doing anything? Mm. But I don't. I only see bit flips when hammering the DRAM with flush and reload. So with memory excesses. Right. And it even works better if I flush and reload multiple memory locations simultaneously. Does it? Now that's odd. That's really odd. So the bits will flip when the charge drops. That is the part that we agree on. Yes. But why? <laughs> maybe the maybe the insulation between the cells is not perfect. I mean, we are in physics here. Nothing is really perfect, right? Right. So what if what if a memory access to one cell actually drains a tiny bit of charge from another cell? Hmm. If that would happen, we would be able to manipulate other memory cells. Even memory locations you can't read or write. That's insane. Hey, what are you talking about? Are you talking about a new attack? Yes. So we hammer the DRAM. And I think we are able to flip bits in the DRAM without accessing them. Yeah. And if that works, we will definitely be famous. Like we learned from the past, we should first search online if there's something like that. And I have to disappoint you, there is already a paper with exactly that title. Flipping oh, bits no. in memory without accessing them. And it seems like it describes exactly what you did. So it already exists. So this Rohan effect. When you access a row very often, bits might flip in a neighboring row. Mm -hmm. Ah, that makes sense. And that's why it works better if I hammer multiple locations, because otherwise I would only reach the row buffer. And even better, if you hammer both direct neighbors of a row, this is called double-sided hammering. So what can you do with this attack? You can manipulate any data. In 2015, Seaborn and Dulian showed that you can manipulate page tables with that and gain kernel privileges. Uh -huh, Aha, that sounds really bad if you can manipulate the kernel, but how does this work? Let's say you could flip a bit in a page table. Which bit would you flip? Maybe, maybe user accessible. But there's only one of them. The bit flips look kind of random. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Random locations, but they will flip in kind of deterministic way. If it flipped once, it will flip again. So you would choose some target with more bits? Yeah. Like uh, the, well, then it's only the page number. Right. And if you flip a bit in there? Then it's, well, assuming it's my own page table, some page mapping will change from that to some other four kilobyte virtual address range. And this, this range will now have different memory contents from, from my perspective. 
but there is likely nothing useful there, right? Right, but what if your entire memory is filled with page tables? Oh, you mean by filling the entire memory with page tables? The, en the entire memory is basically, it doesn't matter what you flip it to. Huh, but how would you get that? You allocate a lot of memory. Uh, just mappings, ideally just mappings without additional physical memory. Mm. That's exactly the trick that Seaburn and Dullian used. They filled the entire memory with page tables. Mm -hmm. Now they have a lot of bits they could target. And if a bit flips, one of their mappings of the user accessible data will change. Oh, to their own page tables very likely, meaning they can manipulate their own page tables. And that's equivalent to kernel privileges. Wow. Yes, being able to manipulate your own page tables means you can change memory mappings, as we've seen, you can change the PFN, and basically point to any physical address with read and write permissions. So I could change, for instance, code of the kernel. For instance, yeah. Or even data, or, or code and data of privileged processes. That's pretty bad. But I mean, you said 2014. Mm -hmm. Why does it still work on this computer then? Is there no patch? It's complicated. You're right. This is much easier with a whiteboard. Yeah, so what could we do against the Rohammer effect or the Rohammer attacks in general? Hmm, maybe like antivirus software, detect it and stop it. Oh, so detection. So the exploit works because um, you have some user row and it's placed next to some victim row. Um, if you prevent that, you kind of neutralize row hammer because you cannot hammer the victim rows anymore. So we could neutralize the row hammer yes. effect. But I think we forgot the obvious one. We could simply eliminate the Rohem effect. So if the hardware is not susceptible to Rohem attacks, there won't be any bit flips, so we don't have to neutralize or detect the flips in the first place. So we have these three categories. These are exactly the categories from 2018 and not a flip in the wall. Yeah, exactly. And then they would basically start with the first one, the first category, and go through the options there. Detection, for instance. There have been quite a few proposals on how to detect row hammer attacks with performance counters, with static analysis of the code, by tracking memory accesses or access patterns. Um, yeah, and even um, double-sided hammering specific uh, ones. Because double-sided hammering is so efficient uh, in, in, in inducing bit flips that they try to monitor this pattern and if they observe it then they would either slow down the victim or induce artificial refreshes which are memory accesses um, something like that i'm not sure if this would work think about the rohem attack we had on sgx i only hammered one location not yeah. multiple ones yeah. this is not the typical rohem pattern but uh, then if you want to detect this with SGX on SGX, you can't use performance counters. So what do you do then? Hmm. Even static code analysis, does it work? The code could be encrypted. That's true. What about neutralization? Ah, there have actually been a lot of work in that direction. So the idea here is to split the aggressor and the victim into different security domains. Ah, and you separate them so the rows exactly. can't reach them. But that's but usually quite expensive. Yeah, because usually DRAM um, rows and banks, they are usually interleaved. So if you, if you take the 64 banks that you have and a row is 8 kilobytes, you would have blocks of up to 500 kilobytes that are um, interleaved that have the same row index. So what distance do you actually need there to, to leave free between the attacker and the victim? Yeah, because sometimes bits even flip on a distance more than one row, so... Mm -hmm. And also, what's, what's, what's the security domain? More in general, where do, you, where do you make the boundary between the kernel and user space, between processes? If you have processes, you have multiple thousand processes running on your system. There would be a lot of space wasted. 
Yeah, if you leave like two megabytes free between every process and have a few thousand running, that's gigabytes of memory that you would have to leave unused. Physical memory, you know. That's not good. Elimination then. Does that work? Can we do this maybe also in software because these systems are already deployed? Well, easy solution here. If you know the data, you can scan for bit flips in your own data. And if you find a location that had a flip, you can put it on a block list so that you no longer use this memory location inside your RAM. Hmm, but I saw thousands of bit flips. So excluding all of this RAM would be a lot. And the scanning the first time you do, it could be imperfect and not find all bit flips. So you're still left with yeah. vulnerable rows. Hmm, okay. So maybe we could do something different. Maybe we could maybe double the refresh rate. So if you reduce the refresh window by a half, basically we double the refresh rate, there's not enough time for bit flip to occur in the first place. Yeah, and in that 2014 Rohammer paper, they mentioned that as a possibility, uh, but uh, they also said it doesn't work because bits still flip at double refresh rate. They needed something like seven or eight uh, times the refresh rate until bit flips really stopped to occur. Um, they also mentioned ECC memory. Um, ECC memory could be a mitigation. Oh, but there was also this ECC exploit paper where you can now leak actual data bits by watching if an ECC correction happens. So basically you have a timing side channel and if ECC needs to correct a bit, then it takes longer. And so you can infer some bit information from the actual RAM. And they also were still able to induce persistent bit flips so that are not corrected. Hmm. But, but it makes it more difficult then. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hmm. So the lab system, it actually has a real row hammer countermeasure, TRR, okay. target row refresh. What does it do? So it has a few trackers and when you access a row after refresh, you get one of these trackers and it increments every time you access the row. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you refresh the rows when the counter exceeds some threshold. Exactly. Yeah, but in practice, it doesn't really work. With more advanced access patterns, you can still flip it. Mm. I've actually seen that. So basically, the problem there is that you have a limited amount of trackers. So if you perform many Rohammer attacks at the same time, you run out of trackers, and then one of these attacks will go through. Yeah. 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 Also, uh, TRR is uh, refreshing what the the neighbor rows. Which which of them? Two the two neighbor rows. We saw bit flips of more than one row apart. Can we add the results from the half double paper here? Uh, from the collaboration with Google. Yeah. So in half double, you have a large number of accesses from distance two, and a really small number from distance one, and that's enough to flip bits. Mm -hmm. Do you need both? I mean, if you have TRR then TRR will do the distance one refreshes. Wait, TRR, that's a mitigation, and now it's assisting your, you in your attack? Yeah, things like that happen if you start building defenses and designing defenses before you fully understand what the underlying problem is. Yeah, so, and we even built an exploit, an off-the-shelf Chromebook that even has ECC memory. So you got kernel privileges on your Chromebook? Yeah, which was tricky, but if you're interested, I can send you the paper. Sure. There were quite a few Rohammer papers in the past years. Also some Rohammer mitigations, but also a Rohammer attack, or some attacks which performed Rohammer from within JavaScript. So from the browser? Yeah, uh, but also there were a lot of mitigation papers, so focusing on some different mitigations in DRAM, but not like TRR, but in some sense in that way. For example, really clever use of cryptography for integrity and correction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think that would be too much for this episode, right? Um, still, Rohammer is not considered a solved problem yet. Okay, um, do you guys have any idea what the students could do for a homework? Can we give them some kind of uh, Rohammer simulator, maybe? Yeah, like a, a program or like a simulation where they can, they need to leak a secret, but they need to induce a flip in order to get the secret. I, I really like that idea. That's good. Well, if these bit flips happen all the time, yeah. why aren't systems crashing all the time? Maybe they are. 
I don't know, maybe systems crash from time. They do crash from time to time, don't they? Yeah, but rarely. I actually have my system, this laptop, and also the one I had before. I have them undervolted since I started studying, and that should also make them more unstable. Right? You never observed anything odd? I mean, it crashes from time to time, but the Windows crashes from time to time. So I didn't, I didn't get the suspicion that it could be because of the undervolting. Um, but then again, the alternative, uh, my system was overheating, so it would crash all the time because of overheating if I wouldn't undervolt it. I think I might have an idea.